So how many people here were here for the first Miami Bitcoin conference? All right, cool. So what my talk's going to talk about is sort of, I was, I was thinking about sort of this concept of where we are now and where we're going. And a great way to, to think about that is looking at, uh, at this event, because I think it's an important event. And it encompasses a few of the themes that I think are important, just kind of things that I think in looking at you know, where, where are we right now? What is the state of this Bitcoin and blockchain world? And where are we going? And uh, so in, in that, a, a few things come to mind. Um, one is how the global economy has changed in a few ways. One being the way that they have become more accepting of this. How many people have seen the recent press from uh, the World Economic Forum at Davos talking about blockchain? So it's, it's a big topic there. It was a little bit of a topic last year, and this is increasing, and we've seen... Uh, so I, I was there, I'll bear with me if you, were, if you were here on that first event as well, um, but it's worth, it's worth taking a trip down memory lane. Uh, the very first Bitcoin, there was no blockchain events. It was all Bitcoin events. The very first Bitcoin event that I went to was out in uh, Vegas, and I was dressed kind of like this. I think even a little more casual. And I walked in and I said, oh boy, that's not, this is way overdressed. So I kind of slid the jacket off. And the Miami event was some months after that. And I remember there's some, there's a bunch of buzz. People said, you see those guys in the front? They're venture capitalists. I mean, people couldn't believe it, that there was venture capitalists here. Couldn't believe that there was lawyers here. And if somebody handed a business card and it was from a real company, the first reaction would be like, do they know you're here? Usually the answer is no. And some of those people went and started their own, their own companies. Uh, it, it, is, it is amazing to see how far we've come. I mean, we didn't really envision these huge companies that are all involved in this technology now. And so the global economy has changed in a couple ways. One, you have much, much greater understanding of this technology. And two, you have the continued things that Jeffrey was just talking about, these horrible monetary policies where uh, they keep inventing new money from, from thin air, printing new money. And uh, it's, it's a house of cards. It was a house of cards in 2008. And since then, things have gotten worse. There's all kinds of the same types of shenanigans that caused the, the uh, 2008 collapse are still going on in full force. And we see the results. We've seen the results with, with uh, the EU. We've seen what's happened in Greece, and Venezuela is one of the best examples. How many people have seen these? Uh, somebody, somebody had a picture of about a stack of cash about this high, and they, and, and they had a banana next to it, and they said, well, th this is how much money you need in Venezuela. It's about $21, which is almost enough to buy a banana. Bananas are going for about $24 US there, apparently, and you need a stack of money this big. So. Currencies fail, that happens. It's happened many times in history. What's interesting now is that Bitcoin exists as an alternative, perhaps. And I think that as more currencies fail the world over, some of these people, and maybe eventually whole countries, will go and say this is an, this is an alternative. Because m most of the countries in the world are at the whim of bad economic policy. There's, there's only three kinds of countries in the world. There's the United States, EU, and countries that peg to mainly the United States. There's, um, well, and so, so it's, it's those, those countries, and then those are the ones that peg to it, and then there's ones that try and do it on their own. None of those models are great. And the central bankers, I, you know, I've politely said to central bankers that I've met before that you know, really your, your currency in many countries, when they're pegged to the US dollar, for example, they, they really don't have a currency. They have US dollars with a different picture on it. You know, in Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, they have U.S. dollars. They just call them rials. In the, in the UAE, uh, dirhams. It's a different person's picture, but they're they're pegged. They have no power at all to do anything for their currency, and that's probably wise because people, particularly in the Middle East, who decide to do things for their own currency, find themselves declared terrorists very quickly and have a reign of democracy coming down on them in the form of bombs. So probably wise of them to keep, uh, to, to keep that. I would too if I was threatened with, uh, you know, bringing democracy is a very grave threat. Um, 
So I'd, I'd probably do the same. But they really don't have any power. And then there's these poor countries, these tiny countries that, that try. I mean, if you go into the bank and you, you go to exchange currency, there's only 20 currencies at most. They, they don't do this in the US. Maybe here in Miami, you, you see some places. But if you're traveling even to a place like Dubai, uh, there's only 20 or so currencies that they even consider important enough. There's a lot of people that they have to trade to another currency to get to a real currency. They have to use something intermediate to say, say okay, I'm going to trade my currency for Thai baht, and now that I have Thai baht, yes, I can get a real currency like uh, you, you know, euros or something. So I think that a lot of these, these economies, or as economies fail, they're going to recognize that, that there are alternatives out there. And that brings us to an interesting point. This is a double-edged sword of this uh, you know, acceptance and understanding of the technology, with that comes misunderstanding, and with that comes drawbacks. Like, for example, uh, this move to digital cash. It, it seems good at first for, for those of us who love this technology. They say, great, they're moving towards digital cash. That's a step in the right direction. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's just a way to put, if, if digital cash is terrible, okay? And, and by the way, blockchains are terrible too, unless they are truly decentralized. The whole purpose of a blockchain is to be a, a, a statement of truth. It's all a blockchain is. It says, what's true? I moved my $1,000 from here to here. I moved five Bitcoin from here to here. I have a land title. Whatever, whatever application for blockchain you're talking about, that's all a blockchain is. It's a ledger that says, this is what's true. This isn't what's true. So when you have things like editable blockchains or uh, you know, centrally controlled blockchains, they're really not blockchains at all. Um, or, or even even just countries saying, hey, we're going to move to digital currency. That's actually uh, a step backwards because what it does, it takes this technology and it guts the key, most important part of it, the decentralization, distributed nature of it. And all that's left is one person and ultimately every, everything, whether it's a company or a country, it's usually the decisions come down to one person. Ultimately one person or a very small group of people have total control of it. So if you're in a country where they say, hey, great news, we're going to have digital currency. Well, if it's, if it's just uh, centrally controlled central bank currency that they make digital, all that does is enable them to have more power to seize it at will from you if they don't like your name or your political party or you didn't pay your uh, taxes to fund for all those, uh, all those bombs are expensive that we drop, bring democracy. Um, and so some of these things can, can actually be a step backwards. Uh, and and that, so that's what's interesting about this is we see all these huge companies adopting this. It'll be very interesting to see what happens with keeping the, the, the core real technology, it, it, for example, with blockchain being truly decentralized and not controlled, um, that's absolutely key. Otherwise, we could end up in a worse situation. So in this, we have this whole kind of Bitcoin versus blockchain debate, which is, which is sort of amusing and interesting. Uh, I, I never really thought of it that way. I believe in blockchain, the technology, and I also am a big believer in Bitcoin. I'm not a Bitcoin purist. I think there's a great place for some of these other coins, tokens, other applications. There may be things that, that, that uh, Bitcoin is unable to do, or there, there's certainly things that will be sort of parallel to Bitcoin that will make sense. Um, in, in my opinion, a lot of those are going to end up on the Bitcoin blockchain, because it, it, we, we, there, this, this conference is a very Bitcoin-centric conference, but there are other ones where there are um, more than 180 degree difference. They're, um, totally focused on blockchain. Any, word, any mention of the word Bitcoin is kind of considered a dirty word. And uh, I, I find that very interesting because, you know, the first question you can ask is, well, what, what blockchain are you talking about? And, and a lot of times they don't have a great answer. So a lot of these blockchain apps that, that are coming along are, uh, as soon as any value or anything of value is being done with them, they're absolutely going to be attacked. Uh, Bitcoin has been attacked far more than probably anything else in the history of computer science, uh, and, and it's been analyzed in, in every way. Uh, these, these, putting, putting blockchain without really thinking, you know, putting, putting the term blockchain first as a buzzword is, I think is a, is a crucial mistake. What other things can we sort of reflect on? I, I think a, another interesting thing that, that has changed over the last few years, um, and, and by the way, I, I think it was the first Miami Bitcoin conference that Ethereum was announced. It was announced at, and it, it didn't even come out until quite a bit later, I think a year and a half later maybe. 
Uh, it was also the day that Charlie Shrem got arrested. So there's a lot of history in this conference where interesting things have happened every year. So tonight you maybe have time to make history yourself, do something interesting that will make the papers. <laughs> Just nothing, don't do anything Mo wouldn't do. Or, or maybe, I don't know if that's the best advice. <laughs> Uh, but the community is still strong, and that's very interesting because you have, you know, this question of, you know, how do you lead something that's leaderless? You know, who, who are the leaders? Um, some people don't like that term at all. You know, I consider leaders to be sort of companies that are funded, people who are doing important things, clearly developers, uh, but also venture capitalists and others who are involved in that, and that, uh, you know, field of, of who the leaders are is growing quite a bit. But I'm encouraged that community is still pretty strong. In those early days, those of us who were there at the first Miami Bitcoin conference or the, or the conferences before that, community was very, very, very strong. Everybody knew everyone. I think I remember going on LinkedIn and I linked anyone who had the word Bitcoin in there. I don't think anybody had blockchain in their title, um, but I linked all 50 people or so. And now if you go, there's, there's I, I think last I checked was 40,000 people have the word blockchain in their name on LinkedIn. So all these new people are, are jumping in, but the community still remains strong. And I, I think that's important because we're gonna have some fights ahead of us. Um, Bitcoin isn't mainstream yet. It's still very, very, very tiny. It's a, a fraction of a major tech stock. I mean, it, it has to, Bitcoin has to go up to what, 10,000 per coin to be the size of Apple, which is still not, I mean, Apple's very important, but it's still not the kind of might that you talk about with countries and, and, and things like that. I mean, you know, you know, Boeing and Lockheed, these companies have had single contracts that are 10 times the size of all the Bitcoin in the world. So we have a ways to go before we're, and it's price is only one measurement. I know there's many other measurements, but we have a ways to go. And in that, there's going to be some hurdles. There's going to be more regulatory issues. There's central bankers are not going to go down without a fight. There's going to be more efforts to make fake blockchains and uh, you know, ha have centralized control and digital cash and these kind of things that are con controlled uh, by governments. And so community will be strong for that because it's important to uh, you know, keep that hardcore ethos about decentralization. Yeah. I I, well, I wasn't with the foundation at the time, but. Yeah. Well, I. I hold on, hold on, hold on. Chill out. This isn't. This isn't a Trump rally or a Hillary rally. Just, uh, calm down. Calm down. Let me. Do you want me to answer you or not? You want to come up or you want me to answer you? All right. Okay, well, you can leave. No, I'm over here. I'm a member of the foundation, okay. and I haven't heard anything. Okay, all right, so you want to hear about regulation. I am against... No, about what the Bitcoin Foundation, due to the election, is doing against the regulation in New York and in California, because the FS is doing something in 2016. When is it coming to be doing something? ACLU is doing something. Okay. You're supposed to be our defender, and I don't hear anything on that side. Yeah, all right. The... You're getting a little off of the topic that I had, I had planned. The, the Bitcoin Foundation made a decision a while ago, before I ever even came, to, to get out of the business of lobbying and uh, policy making. So, you know, I'm sorry about that. I wasn't there. I wasn't part of it. For my, for my part, I stood on this very stage and I said that Ben Lasky is a corrupt liar. And uh, the reason that I think he's corrupt is because of uh, the way that the bit, li bit license was done in, in bed with the banks. Uh, I think it's a protectionist, uh, you know, horrible regulation. The Bitcoin Foundation, and again, this is before I was there, so, you know, I, I, I certainly not here to be in a position of defending things that happened before I was there. Just for those of you who are not up to speed, I was uh, executive director for about a year for the Bitcoin Foundation. I'm a board member now. I'm no longer executive director. The executive director, Lou, is, is here at this event. He may be in the audience. Uh, may hide now after this, but <laughs> but uh, Luke Clausen is, is is a good guy. Uh, I mean, we can only do so. There's only so much that that, uh, that that can be done. The Bitcoin Foundation did respond with the largest uh, 
the most comprehensive response to the bit license, a 30-page response. It was done by Marco Santori, who's a leading lawyer. Uh, the time that he put into that and his, and his staff put into that is if you, if you were to ask that to be done and pay his legal rates, you're talking about a very, very, very significant amount of money. Okay. In the boardroom. I still haven't heard from you on one It's it's not the mandate of the foundation. It's, it's, it's not the, it's it's not it's there's policy groups. You should start your you you should start a policy group if that's your thing. I'll join you if you want. It's 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 a different it's a different mission than what the foundation you know the foundation so the Re, re, lobbying, uh, things things change a lot. The, the, things change over time. The, the, and, and I'm not. We can talk offline about it if you want to get into you know, what the foundation is. The foundation uh, was a, partly a victim of its own success. They had a lot of uh, donations. Bitcoin went way up. Foundation had millions and millions and millions of dollars. Thought that the price was going to keep going. They spent a lot of money, overspent, and then they were hit with the double whammy of the price crashing uh, and spending too much. After that, I came aboard in a turnaround situation to try and help out the situation. So, by the way, as a volunteer, I didn't get paid to do this. I did it because I, I thought that the organization was useful and uh, there was a place for it. Now, the foundation, the other mistake that I think the foundation made when, it, when the foundation started was the only organization in this space. So, you know, certainly overpromised and underdelivered. Because it was the only organization, people expected the Bitcoin Foundation to do everything. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is not centralized. Uh, th th that mistake, no, nobody has mistaken the Bitcoin Foundation for being, you know, in charge of Bitcoin for quite a while. You have the ability to do just as you're doing, and great job. If you're fighting BitLicense, good, good for you. I hope that other people will help you. Like I said, I'll help you. But people can only do what they're, um, you know, what they're able to do. All of the board members and me and the executive director are all uh, volunteers. The executive director, in some ways, volunteer. But uh, all of the board members and me, and during the time that, that I was executive director, the, the, the position was pre previously a paid position, I did as volunteers. There's only so many hours in the day that people have. And uh, the, the decision was made before I even came that given the limited resources and, the, and at the time the price cr crash, that the foundation would not be fighting the lobbying battles because they were very, very, very difficult. Uh, the, li the foundation is basically licensed. I mean, it is. Uh, it does have the nonprofit status where it is able to engage with regulators, but um, you know that's you know they, they just can't do everything. And um, if you put yourself in, in the position of me or, or someone else who's there, what, what exactly do you do? How, how do you do these things? Do I force somebody? Do I call up a member and say you have to go and, and be at this meeting? Do do I take even more time out of my day? And, and my family and go down and do even more volunteer work to stand by your side in New York, I'll do that. But when you have an all volunteer organization in an open source space, it's, if, if you want to change, be the change. So, so if you're being a change, good, good for you, but it's not super fair, I think, to criticize people, particularly people who weren't even there, but to criticize people who are giving their time and donating their time. We did a DevCore event, so we, it's training the next generation of developers, for example. Um, you know, was it the greatest event in the world? N no. Was it a good success? Did it do good things for, for Bitcoin? Yeah, um, I think it is. And, and because the foundation was in such a high prominence position, I think it's easy to criticize and say, oh, well, that's all you did was, you know, this event and, and a couple other things. But the, uh, you know, that, that's a challenge when you have, uh, you know, an open source space and all, all volunteer space. But, I mean, I'll, I'll talk to you a after about it. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely, uh, you know, a problem with regulation. That's what I was just getting to. I think that there's going to be a fight that we should all be part of. And if there's an organization that you're part of or you start that is going to fight things like bit license, I'll be there with you. I think that took up our time. Sorry about the tangent there, but um, I, think that, I think that's it. So thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate your time. Have a good one.